Welcome to Chasing Creativity. I'm Kiran Mandral. I'm a writer and an author and I live and thrive on creativity. Today, I am chatting with Anuja Chandramoli. Anuja is a best-selling Indian author of many, many books and she writes across fantasy, across mythology, across history. Welcome to the conversation, Anuja. Hi, Kiran. So, historical fiction, Anuja, and mythology. Why did you decide to take this combination up? I know the first book was Arjun and that's how you started. So was that like a path you inexorably set off on because you started with Arjun? I get asked this question a lot and uh, I think each time I'm trying to figure it out on my own also as to why I'm writing about mythology and historical fiction mainly. Uh, but I think uh, uh, it it just happened. There was no, there, I, I, you just figured out you know, right now, no, I'm not very tech savvy. I won't even call myself a smart cookie, actually. This was just a path I stumbled on, actually, because uh, I was thinking of uh, what I should write about, you know, when this idea about working on a book popped into my head. It was probably an extremely masochistic impulse happening. I can't think of any other rational explanation for it. And uh, I remember those uh, uh, Archie comics we used to read, no? And I used to relate with Betty, not because she was blonde and skinny and all, but because she wanted to grow up and become a journalist. And she kept a journal, a diary, actually. And uh, I also used to do that as a tween. I'd keep a diary. I felt my thoughts were important enough to record. And I remember in one of those stories, somebody gives her that advice that she has to write about the things she knows about, the things she cares deeply about. And uh, I asked myself, what do I care about other than chocolate, maybe? And uh, the answer was simple enough. It was Arjuna, like you pointed out, the great love of my life. And so that's how it happened. I thought, okay, my first book has to be about Arjuna. I didn't even think that there was a mythology boom happening in India at the time. Amish and Anand and Ashwin Sanghi and Ashok Banker, Asha Satar, they'd all written such brilliant books at the time and it was quite the rage. But I hadn't read any of their books at that particular time. I'd read only Ashwin's Chanakya's chant, I think. But barring that, I wasn't really familiar with the space. And this was just one of those random, extremely impulsive decisions which kind of propel you along a path, no? And the weird thing is, I was pregnant at that time with my second daughter. And the elder one hadn't even turned two at that time. So like I said, it was an incredibly masochistic impulse. Just popped into my head, I couldn't get rid of it. And uh, it just propelled me along this path, which I eventually took. So that's all there is to it, actually. I think we all do that. We set ourselves on masochistic paths. And uh, that's, that's I think, the fate of all writers, right? Or all creative people, so to speak. I mean, you this is a path you know you're going to suffer terribly, but we are on it and we're having fun on the way. Why Arjuna? You said he was the love of your life. What about him was so fascinating that you had to write a book on him? I mean, he has been written off before. So what did you think you would bring differently to the table apart from, of course, the female gaze? Again, uh, Arjuna is part of my earliest memories, I think. Krishna used to be my childhood imaginary friend. So he was the first character from that world I uh-huh. was introduced to. I heard his story when I was, uh, I must have been under two at the time. I hold the family record for being the fastest speaker. I was speaking full sentences before I was a year old. And uh, my, oh wow, <laughs> exactly. So my grandmom told me Krishna's story, baby Krishna's story. You know, there's lots of violence in that story where Kamsa mm-hmm. uh, picks up Devaki's children by the feet newborn children and bashes their brains out. My grandmom didn't really skimp on the details. So, you know, it was just gory stuff. <laughs> and I think it was, I, I was so horrified. Oh my God, this guy is killing babies. And then there's the, you know, you feel transported to that world where there's danger and, you know, the seas part to allow this blue baby to cross. And my grandmom used to just bring it to life for me. And I used to repeat the story verbatim just the way she said it. And any time she had guests, and she was very popular, so people were forever popping in to see her. She'll make me sit on the dining table, people will be gathered around, and I had to tell this story. And they will all applaud, because I was this tiny puppet telling them the story. And that was like, you know, the first sound of applause, and you get addicted to it, right? It's part of your early... Dopamine hits. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Early dopamine hits. Exactly, I felt like Madhuri Dixit. 
you know, from the uh, from what was that hit song of Ek Do Ek Do Teen that was also oh, happening, teen. and I wasn't a very good dancer. So when I danced on the table to Ek Do Teen, the response wasn't the same, wasn't quite the same <laughs> as when I told the story of Baby Krishna. So I think and that was when. I I started to feel that you know being a storyteller was something I was good at of course you're not thinking about all these things at that age it was just there in my head okay I can tell stories mm-hmm. and uh, uh even in school kg first grade second grade all my classmates I was a voracious reader I used to read these comics and I used to repeat these stories told by my grandmother so they'll all ask me for stories so all my classmates will insist whenever it's story time they'll say we want anuja's stories so again you feel like a superstar and uh, um uh, when i was old enough to read these comics probably again it was like second grade first grade uh, my dad and his sisters were voracious readers they have this collection of books at home so i used to pick up these amar chitra katha comics and uh, the mahabharata was my favorite you didn't that back then it was all just bound copies you know there are many comics so you know i got the story fed to me you know like uh, appetizers one appetizer at a time so you know i i, okay. I always wanted more i was like what happens next this is only draupadi story this is only arjuna story this is only bhima story so you know i and my dad would keep buying me more books as i got older all mahabharata books and uh, again my introduction to arjuna when i read that uh, it's how uh, everyone knows this famous story in india i guess about how the pandavas were born yudhishthira mm-hmm. is born to dharma bhima is the strongest one and arjuna even then he was special no indra's son and it was proclaimed that he'll be the greatest warrior of them all and i thought okay i i think even as a kid i didn't root for the underdog i think i root for the winning team always <laughs> <laughs> so they, i'm like okay this guy is a winner so he's my favorite and he's krishna's friend also so that was a further recommendation and this was pure love i decided okay i love this guy he's always so successful and he's so sweet also I just really loved him. I guess you know you read Ullupi's story, and he's not exactly in love with her or anything. She falls in love with him, but he's kind. I thought it was very sweet that he's always kind. That you know he has this reputation for being arrogant and all, but I always I like his arrogance. Don't get me wrong. I like his attitude. I like everything about him, but I like his kindness. I like that he's sweet to everyone around him. He tries to do his best by the people in his life. So I think that's what really endeared me to this chap. Plus the fact that he was he was going to be the top dog always, so <laughs> <laughs> so always rooting for the top dog. You know uh, when you're writing mythology, there is uh, only so much you can do with the story, right, Anuja? Yes, it's already already been written before, and you can give your interpretation to it. to the other characters you can build up the minor characters you can place your characters in settings that may be unfamiliar in a certain way you know at the end of the day the story is, has been told before so is that some kind of pressure that you face as somebody who writes mythology you've written more mythology after that your most recent book was abhimanyu so i mean and abhimanyu is another very fascinating character and we don't really know much about him apart from that one act which defines him about getting into the chakra view how do you build these characters how do you bring your own unique perspective to them and how do you flesh them out make them real because that's a huge task well, i think uh, that's the fun part of it kiran because uh, as you pointed out on the one hand these stories are tried and tested practically everyone know a lot of people know these stories in india and they don't like it if you mess with something uh, that is you know embedded so deeply in their consciousness so i would th- i i treat the original story as the foundation upon which i build that's what i do because uh, again uh, as a psychology major i think i'm very interested in what motivates these characters the internal plumbing basically i just want to know why they do the things they do and uh, i think i bring a certain psychological insight into the uh, when i write about these characters and more importantly these are characters who've been placed on a pedestal you have gods and goddesses and heroes superheroes so we revere these characters but for me maybe because uh, i've known them from when i was two maybe that for me they are friends they're close friends so i am very very intrigued only by the attributes we would describe as human you know so that's what uh, fascinates me i want um, my reader to feel like they have the same relationship with these characters like a buddy or you know someone you're having a very intimate relationship with 
someone you feel close to you get why they do the things they do you wind up speaking the same language after a point so that's what i wanted to capture the closeness of this bond because uh, i'll go back to this krishna who i was telling you about in my relationship with him just to help you understand my approach so uh, I, when i was a kid i had these night terrors i couldn't sleep at night because i had a very active imagination and i'll scare myself you know i'll i'll make my feet i'll just pour water on my feet and i'll i'll make these footprints on this courtyard we had and i'll pretend that those footsteps were following me that they were not mine it was somebody else some ghost girl's footprints i i used to just scare myself like that so I, after a point i'll really think there's this ghost pursuing me and i won't be able to sleep at night i i don't know why i did that to myself I, that was really overactive imagination yeah, at work really it was a bit insane or <laughs> and uh, you know i, I saw uh, it was um, you see these movies on tv little things no uh, the wizard of oz i used to the wicked witch of the west really scared me with the green makeup and all and i used to visualize her standing behind me you know trying to get at me with her claws so i used to do these weird things where i freak myself out and i'll be i'll wake up at night and i'll scream for my mom and i'll say i can't sleep i'm scared so and she had this huge picture of uh, baby krishna a very beautiful painting which she'd framed and put over there and she'll say see krishna is there the right next to you so don't think of witches and all that krishna only is there you look at you just think of him and you go back to sleep i think she was just exhausted and she just said whatever it would take to get me to quiet down and so i think i grew up you know having these imaginary conversations with krishna and most of it i'll be yelling at him i'll say you're a horrible friend you never you don't actually come and talk to me i am the one who's doing all the talking you never respond you never respond you never respond you never respond so i just yelled at him growing up i think and uh, so he's like that like a buddy i scream at most of the time so it's like you know there's a certain irreverence for me when it comes to these gods and goddesses and superheroes so i think that's uh, uh, that's something which uh, i i enjoy about working with these characters and there's always scope for your imagination in this space because uh, there's always a new angle which you can bring in there's always some little nuance to explore actually so if you take arjuna it was a pretty much straightforward uh, retelling where uh, i stayed i hewed to the original uh, narrative but i just uh, explored cause and effect a little bit more and uh, why things panned out the way they did in arjuna's life but abhimanyu like you mentioned outside of the 16th day we have very little information about this character you know he was like the shooting star there one second outshone the rest and he was gone in a flash so you know i had to retrace his journey i had to see that world through his eyes from when he was a baby and it was insane because i i've been reading the mahabharata all my life and yet i was surprised by how much more there was to discover if you only shift your perspective a little bit so you know the entire thing is seen through his eyes through his mother's eyes when he is a baby so badra is such a powerful beautiful woman she is so badra's uh, brother balarama krishna so yeah, you know everything whatever i had in explored in arjuna i explored here Uh, there i felt that the elder three brothers had outshone the twins nakula and sahadeva so here suddenly you know during abhimanyu's childhood he's hanging out with these guys because they are the youngest in that generation so somehow they are closer to the brat pack so it was it was nice to see how they you know just to uh, see how they interact with each other it felt like i was just seeing them through abhimanyu's eyes and how they used to rough house with these guys and you get fresh insights into their personalities little uh, little lesser known information about these guys while i was doing my research no about their travels the battles they fought the little stories that um, uh, flesh out their characters more so it was this beautiful journey from abhimanyu's birth to the day of his death and it was gut wrenching kiran i wasn't prepared for it actually i was but even so when i told you the masochist in you you know there's going to be pain and suffering <laughs> but you're not prepared when it tears you apart trust me because even when i wrote arjuna abhimanyu's chapter was the toughest to write every time i wrote that chapter i edited that chapter i'll cry over it and this book I I kind of hesitated to even get started but when I did it was like me I think I cried over every word every chapter it was insane it was insane but it was also a very beautiful rewarding experience because I got to know him so much better and and I wouldn't trade that for anything in the world 
Which brings me to another question, Anuja. You know, when you're writing from a slew of characters, both mythological as well as historical, and you've written the female characters, you've written Ganga, you've written uh, Padmavati, you've written uh, Mohini, as well as the male characters, Tughlaq. These are a cross-section of people. They are mythological, they are historical, they are male, they come from different eras, different times. What makes you choose somebody to write on? What makes you pick up a character, a personality as, I'm going to explore this person's life in my next I, I always say, uh, it, it makes me sound extremely pompous when I say it, but uh, I don't actually choose the characters. I feel they choose me. It is how it is, isn't it? I, I did describe how it happened with Arjuna, just a random impulsive thing. And uh, while I was working on uh, Arjuna, there was this very interesting character who's Krishna's son. It's Pradyumna and he's there in a couple of scenes only in that book. But to my surprise, he didn't like Arjuna much. He didn't, when I wrote him for some <laughs> reason, he wasn't as taken with Arjuna as the others, you know, who were all probably reflecting, projecting my emotions. This guy was somewhat resentful. He focused on Arjuna's uh, negative traits and he was resentful of the fact that his dad spent so much time with his cousin. So, you know, this Pradyumna's character, it intrigued me a little bit. Because it, again, I knew that, I know Pradyumna's story also. He was uh, Kamadeva, reborn. So basically, it just intrigued me at that point that here was this interesting character, very strong character who had such a, uh, you know, again, he had a very strong presence. And after Arjuna was done, I was talking with my editor about what we could work on next. And suddenly uh, Pradyumna Kama popped into my head. And I thought that would be fun. That would be fun. Let's see. Uh, and again, I, I, again, you're not prepared for how it pans out. I thought it would be a very sensuous book, but um, a very Kama Sutra type book. But it turned out to be a very sweet, very, uh, again, and Kama was somewhat different from what I expected of him, Kama and Pradyumna. So, and Kama again is a devotee of uh, the mother goddess of Shakti. So, you know, there, she pops in there. The Shakti. Yeah, Shakti. Okay. So, God is Gauri and he's a devotee and he loves her. And uh, I was, again, I was surprised uh, at how those scenes, I hadn't planned it, how the interactions with him and this goddess panned out. So, she was, when, even when I was done with the book, I wasn't done with this character. So, my next book was on Shakti. And it was like that. While working on Shakti, I ran into Yama. My next two were fantasies. So, Yama's lieutenant. And then uh, uh, the historical characters, again, um, Prithviraj was this character. Uh, we had his story in our third standard English textbook, Prithviraj and Samyukta. And for the longest time, I assumed it was the gospel truth that, you know, he, uh, th that he carried her, way at the, uh, her away at the Sibayambara where a statue of him had been placed, which she'd garlanded. I thought it was the height of romance. And when you start doing the research, you know, you, you, you think... <laughs> it's oh, very disillusioning. Exactly. Satviraj <laughs> <laughs> and Padmavati, I was, uh, you know, I was asked if I would be interested in uh, researching and working on a book on Padmavati. And I, I thought, okay, why not? Uh, again, she's a very interesting character. And uh, with Padmavati, you know, I didn't want to glorify Johar because I don't understand why women have to burn on the altar of male ambition. <laughs> So I wanted to do a fresh take on Padmavati. So that was something which appealed to me. So it's like that these characters just happen. And uh, I'm very interested in strong female voices because I think it's very, I think it's such a misconception. The weaker sex concept is so weird. We all know females are the deadlier species. So I don't get why there's so much confusion on the score. And I wanted to write about powerful women who do not, uh, who aren't victims, who don't see themselves as victims, even if they are the victims of violence, who find a way to rise from the ashes, to reinvent themselves and to live their best possible lives. So Ganga, Mohini, Shakti, I loved writing these strong women characters and uh, it's like, it's been very life changing and very inspiring for me. And uh, a lot of readers also have reached, uh, reached out after reading Shakti and all. For instance, uh, during the Kerala floods, a reader told me that, um, you know, the entire area was flooded and she was reading Shakti and she said it was such a comfort. So things like that, no, you know, it just makes it worthwhile, I guess. Absolutely. Uh, have you ever thought about writing a character who is completely fictional, somebody completely out of your imagination? Not a character who has already existed before, either in history or mythology. Uh, has that ever come to you? I mean, I know you've written fantasy, 
but you have based it on a character from mythology but something completely new is completely fresh is that something you've been toying with uh, in even in the fantasy genre uh, yama there's one thread which belongs to yama but yama's lieutenant was entirely a creature from my imagination so that was my first foray into you know a character who does not exist outside of my head so that was a lot of fun and uh, but uh, you know the, my mythological books have been more successful honestly than the historical <laughs> fiction and fantasy ones so my editors are always trying to gently nudge me back into the mythology space but uh, i definitely want to experiment i am impressed by someone like you kiran because you refuse to be bound by any genre i think you write about everything under the sun you know you write romance you write uh, those goth horror <laughs> psychological <laughs> thrillers and your latest is a uh, sci-fi fantasy so i i think i'm very inspired by you so i definitely want to experiment with a few genres horror is a genre i've been meaning to write about for, write on for the longest time so that's definitely something on the bucket list and during the lockdown i worked on a few short stories novellas which are entirely fictional so who knows maybe something uh, will happen in that space maybe i will do something maybe uh, th- maybe there's a book or two in there hopefully definitely and i also want to talk about another thing that you do that is your dance and uh, you write of course and you write very well at that you write articles you write books you do a lot of uh, you do your podcast on mythology but there is also this side of anuja chandramouli who is a dancer and quite an accomplished dancer at that so how do you pursue these multiple passions simultaneously and how does each feed off on the other you're such a sweetheart kiran you're so good for my ego <laughs> but uh, i i think i'm a jack of all trades i think i have a very restless uh, disposition i think uh, my attention span is very limited so i keep hopping from one thing to the other so i'm i'm basically very very fortunate and privileged to be able to pursue my passions and uh, dance i've never thought of myself as a very good dancer because i remember i did try to pull off a madhuri dikshit as a child i did try to dance for the ek do teen number but uh, you know uh, and they, they even then there used to be a lot of people who asked me to dance also but there'll be more people who ask for my stories so i think that made an impression even at a young age i feel like i'm a better writer than a dancer and even dance just came into my life uh, you know out of the blue i i used to dance in school and college i was part of indian dance club stuff like that but uh, uh, after i was married uh, i met my guru at an event where both of us were the were the judges for some fashion show or something and she told me why don't you come i told her i'm a lousy dancer she said yeah i am sure you're a lousy dancer just come just come and join so i thought why not again it was an impulsive thing and uh, that's how i started from scratch and uh, i performed my arangetram and i love having music and dance in my life and since i write on uh, indian mythology I w- i'll always be surprised at how there's this weird overlap between a piece i'm doing here and uh, the, a book i'm working on one particular example was uh, after i finished shakti my editor was again uh, begging me to write about another character and he kept saying ganesha and i was toying with the idea of a book on ganesha and that time uh, i was doing a solo piece it's a shanmuga kautuvam a murugan kautuvam it was my first solo and i was working hard on it i i played the uh, i i just played the track and uh, i was recording it and uh, suddenly i heard you know peacocks outside i was upstairs and i heard the peacocks the rockus the whole <laughs> tone which these peacocks have i hear them ye- screeching outside and i'm thinking i'm recording shut up but they were just and you know they wouldn't stop and then the sharanam comes and suddenly there's silence and i don't stop recording and i wait for the song to get over and then i glance out of the window and the roof the garage every you know as far as the i could see there were peacocks there were peacocks there oh, really? really this That's happened wonderful. yeah it was and you know that was that goose flesh inducing moment so they they were all just standing there in silence and as i looked at them they just melted away suddenly and suddenly it was quiet and empty again it was just this it was so weird such a coincidence that i'm playing this uh, shan this piece on uh, kartikeya and his vahana the peacock shows up so uh, and I, i it just stayed with me i don't want i don't want to make a huge deal out of it huh? the just the the day stayed in my head and i told my editor okay I'll, how about uh, kartikeya 
instead of Ganesha and he said yeah sure <laughs> and that's how it happened and uh, it, it's it'll be like that it'll be like that dance and uh, this there'll be a weird overlap like I'm performing a piece and I'll get some insight you know while I'm working on the book it won't be anything I've planned it'll be weird stuff like that like when I wrote Shakti again I was in Odisha for a lit fest and my mum had come along and she was being a typical tourist she had 100 temples to visit and I just pointed at, I saw her itinerary, I said, I won't be able to join you and when to hang out at the Lit Fest only, you go ahead. And I looked at her list and I said, oh, there was this 24 Yogini temple and I told her, uh, I'll, sh- I'll come to this temple alone before, the, before leaving for the airport, we'll stop at this temple. At that time, I just saw the list and I pointed at it. I knew nothing about it. I hadn't read up on it, nothing. And uh, mm-hmm. we go there and, uh, you know, the priest there told us it's this, uh, we, it's, have you been there? It's way out of the way. I you have to go some distance from Bhuvaneshwar. And I was thinking, okay, we are lost because there's no sign of civilization there. And this is one of those open air temples. There is no sanctum sanctorum. It was wild. It was mysterious. There was the spiritual energy in this place. And the priest told us that there are only four uh, temples like that in India. And two... Okay. Uh, and he said two, nobody knows where they are and uh, only two are accessible. He said the other one was in Kolkata and it's one of the themes in the book was how all roads lead to the goddess. So for me, again, it had a lot of significance because I just finished the book and just randomly out of the blue, I was at this very rare temple, the Shakti temple and it's, it's small things like that. So it's, it's very mystical and spiritual and it's a lot of fun actually for me to explore these overlapping uh, themes. So it's dance also. I'm very lucky to have dance and music in my life along with the writing. And they feed off each other and uh, they keep me sane, I think. Otherwise, I'll be bouncing off the walls. (laughs) All of us, all of us. We need that little thing to stay sane and not bounce off the walls. Uh, Anucha, I'll have one more question on your dance and then we'll get into a deep dive on creativity. You know, when you start dancing at an age after you've had children, the body is different. Your suppleness is different. I know that Rukmini Devi Arundele also started late. She didn't have children. Pratima Bedi started late, Odyssey late. Sonal Mansingh trained at Odyssey late. She was already a Bharatanatyam performer, but, you know, learning a new dance form after a certain age. Did you ever find it difficult in terms of this is what my body could have done had I learned earlier. And this is what I have to struggle to do now. I mean, as a performer, do you feel that uh, hindrance? Oh, definitely, definitely. Not a day goes by when I don't think, my God, if, I, if I'd only started training at five or something, which is how they originally did it. So I had a very challenging pregnancy. My first pregnancy was very challenging. There were a lot of pregnancy-related complications. It took me six months to be pain-free, to just be pain-free. So, you know, I told myself, no, I said uh, I'm very much into fitness. So I told myself I'm going to get it back. I'll work towards it. I will go back to uh, being strong and fit. So this was something I consciously worked towards to regain my strength. But this is the key word. You work towards it. You do your strength training, you do your cardio, you do your yoga for mobility and flexibility. Whereas in dance class, there are lots of kiddos who don't bother with that crap, by the way. And their energy levels are always through the roof and they never try. Me, on the other hand, I'm constantly pushing. If I see a kid next to me, you know, in a full out lunge, I'll put in that effort so that I match her. And you know, that kid won't be trying and you're painfully aware of it. Because those kids are there in the moment, they are enjoying the dance, they are not trying to prove anything to anybody. As an adult, your approach itself is different. You're like, I have to do this right. So that also affects your dance. I feel not in a good way. There's a certain heaviness that seeps in as a performer, where it feels like you're straining. And yet, and yet, and yet, you shouldn't give up. Because because the thing with dance, music, art, writing is that it allows you to transcend your limitations, to transcend your physical limitations and get into the zone where anything is possible, where, you know, there's truth, there's beauty, there's magic. So I've, uh, uh, I've, I'm happy that I worked so hard that I didn't give up because there were moments when it felt effortless. 
for instance uh, there was this uh, margam at the end of which my uh, i i like to show off if i can because i told you i actually feel threatened by all the youngsters who do these things <laughs> um, you know without trying so after a varnam or something when the body is warm and you're feeling it no i'll occasionally do a split or i'll do a cartwheel or i'll do a headstand you know just to see if i can still do it and all the kids will be like yeah akka you did a split and so i remember my teacher my guru wanted me to do a split as part of the finale and i have a very tragic experience with the split because uh, i injured my right leg once so i was a little nervous but i also thought let's go for it and you know i struggled with the split during the months of practice but that day on stage sometimes the nridangam gail get very enthusiastic the singer will get very enthusiastic and they'll be singing on and on and on and on and on and you're stretched out in a full split out there and some some days you some days you'll be like oh my god kill me now but that day i felt nothing it was comfortable on that day on that day i could do anything the impossible was possible normally i'll count 1 2 3 4 5 and i won't be able to hold the split longer than that i'll crawl out of the split it won't even be graceful but on that day i stayed for a long time in fact my guru said i was worried i thought you'd fainted there or something and uh, but i hadn't and i eased back up for the first time in my life i eased back onto my feet and somebody told me i don't know how you were smiling throughout so you know these are you didn't think these things were possible you didn't think that you could do it at 35 but you did do it and there's a lot of satisfaction to be had from that so preeti shana and i always talk about how yoga has made us flexible how we can do the headstand and the cartwheel and that's wow factor no you get the applause and i told you i'm such a sucker for applause i guess so you know i'm just glad i stuck with it and really we shouldn't let ourselves be defined by our limitations i think even if they are there absolutely absolutely and uh you've naturally taken me into another topic that i wanted to talk about that is the zone the creative zone when you are in the zone while dancing you're in the zone while writing everyone talks about it but what is the zone what is this zone that everybody is seeking according to you the uh, the zone is something which cannot be described it cannot be explained i feel it varies from person to person it can only be experienced uh, and uh, for me personally i think uh, i i'll use Ra- rafael nadal to explain the zone because he's my favorite and uh, so in the tennis world he's also spoken about it virat kohli talks about it so i, I think the zone is this place it's a place you have to work your way towards it doesn't happen with a snap of a finger or anything you do it one painful step at a time you let go of all the things that are holding you back in real life uh, we talked about how writers are masochists i think it will extend to all artists we are masochists and uh, we are such a cliche no we are a bundle of insecurities and there are so many nameless fears which plague us i think slowly step by step you let all of that go you hollow yourself out you just empty yourself out so that there's nothing there you stop you cease existing all that exists is what you're working towards when i'm writing it's just what i what that particular chapter that scene needs i empty myself out and pour it into that space i give everything i have it might seem so i mean a lot of people won't get why you you putting so much effort you know people will be like how many people read your books anyway reading is dead with netflix and amazon who reads why so much effort for you know such a minimal return on investment but i think you leave all those considerations aside what you get out of it what you're putting into it none of it ma- none of it matters all that matters is what you're working towards whether it's a grand slam championship whether it's a cricketing world cup whether it's the performance of a lifetime in a role that you know means something to you other people may not see it they may not get it they may see it as insig- insignificant as something trivial they may not get artistic angst but to an artist this is our bread and butter this is the actual bread and butter this is what we chase after so that in that moment it all feels perfect like you're not writing the words you're not dancing there's some force which you access some force which you kind of tuned into and that moves you you become a puppet on a string the words come of their own accord the characters have a mind of their own you're no longer in the driver's seat you're just strapped in for the ride 
you go where the music take you takes you you go where the words and the story take you and it's and i think there's nothing more beautiful than being in the zone i i think i'm happiest when i'm in the zone it's pure happiness because there's no sadness there just the intensity of the moment you you don't feel alive outside of that space once you've experienced it <laughs> you feel so keenly alive you feel you part of something that's so much bigger than you see i told you i'm a pompous ass when i talk like this but that's it but that's it for me getting and by the way getting into the zone is one thing it will take your life and your heart and your soul it will take everything you have and uh, staying there is impossible you can't stay in the zone forever you'll slip you'll try to claw and claw your way back in but you'll be out of the zone in a heartbeat and the thing is you never know whether you'll make it back inside again so it's the high you keep pursuing yeah it's unpredictable right some days you slip into the zone very easily some days you can try your best but uh, there's no way you get into it and you will struggle through it wait write procrastinate do other things drink lots of coffee but that zone will elude you for that day how do you fill your creative well anuja what do you do to replenish yourself i know you read a lot because you do review a lot apart from reading other books and apart from dancing what are your uh, forms of inspiration again i don't have a very clear cut process i just draw from everything you know that kiran i know you do it too everything is fodder for the creative mill right any conversation any cannon fodder anuja cannon fodder <laughs> not just cannon fodder <laughs> i know i remember your book right missing presumed dead it's a brilliant book by the way i reviewed it and uh, you'd mentioned you. that uh, you. it was something which you'd put away in the vault because you did know of a lady who'd gone missing and nobody ever knew what became of her and somehow that stayed with you and one day you know a book popped out from the vault thanks to that one thing which happened in your life i think that's how it is for us uh, artists so people have to be aware of us be careful because you know uh, you know i never <laughs> i like i'm drawn to darkness i think so all these stories which people share with you they when they make you privy to their deepest darkest secret it it will come out in some form or the other in, in my books again i store stash it in the vault and i use it when i feel the creative well springs running dry hoping that somehow the water gushes out again uh, i have my yoga i think yoga has really helped me Uh, because otherwise i'm swinging from one end of the pendulum to the next you swing between this euphoric stage and then you're very very depressed some days because like you mentioned some days the zone is completely out of your reach and uh, you're not you don't you're not feeling it creatively right so those i don't handle those days well uh, and really difficult to be around on those days because i'll be functioning on autopilot i'll go through the motions but i won't be there and there'll be a, i'll be exuding a certain dark unpleasant restless energy so it's not easy for the people in my life and i don't want it to be hard on everyone else so i think i try to pull myself back and yoga has really helped with that um, i can't meditate to save my life i'm too restless i remember my yoga teacher tell me my yoga instructor will say ma'am why do you te- treat these breathing exercises meditation all of that you treat it like unwanted children ma'am please you have to <laughs> because the asanas are fun i like pushing myself i like challenging myself but breathing meditation she said that's what yoga is but it took me a long time to simply do the breathing exercises for at least 10 minutes i'll force myself to do it like bitter medicine but over the years i can i'm getting better meditation i still i don't think i can meditate for longer than 2 minutes without going mad but I'm, but i feel that even the little i do has made a difference make it has made me uh, marginally calmer uh and marginally, marginally that's the so at least i haven't picked up the sledge hammer like an inclined to do on some days and take out somebody who's irritating me or with it so so i i credit yoga for that and i i try to uh, i'm grateful for the friends i have in my life sometimes just hanging out with friends and getting away from yourself and the voices in your head because i, I seriously i think i have a monster artistic ego and i think uh, it's nice not to feed it all the time i think there are times when i tell myself you're not that important what you do is not of earth shattering significance you are the center of your world but you're not the center of the world so i need those reminders in my life and i think i have friends who keep me very grounded who are, who have no patience 
for my nonsense basically though they are very <laughs> indulgent when i'm being ridiculous so i'm grateful for all that in my life but uh, this is a very positive way of looking at it some days are bad kiran some days are bad i just want to stay in bed for the rest of my life hibernate for the duration of eternity just not get out from under the blankets i just want to stay there like that because it's it's hard it's it really drains you some days when you and especially i think the pandemic after the pandemic again the publishing industry has been hit hard we talked about return of investment how you put so much in and you feel like uh, when you're all drained empty and you feel this void in your life either it's a swirling vortex of darkness or it's an empty void i don't know which one's worse at times so th- these are the dark dark days and uh, uh you, you, there's always the fear that one day you won't make it out of the void that the void will get you that the demons and the darkness you're running away from they'll get you so these are the senseless fears the dread the nameless dread the paranoia which you also wrestle with that is also the reality of uh, pursuing the creative arts which we don't usually talk about do we we drink our coffee and we laugh it off and we i i at least try to pretend to be a cool person because i'm not actually a cool person i think so it these are the dark days and uh, i honestly uh, i just hunker down and wait for a reason to smile again because that happens that because you know nothing the good thing about bad things is you know they don't last and the bad thing about good things is they don't last either last either that's true so i keep telling myself that i'll say okay just uh, write it out write it out write it out write it out and i try and do whatever makes me happy which is why i have these love handles because chocolates make me happy and my dentist is very unhappy about it with my cavities and all but uh, whatever it takes to tide you over the rough patches Yeah, chocolates are always acceptable cavities can be fixed and you are a very cool person indeed anuja <laughs> thank you so much for this lovely conversation it was so good to chat with you about writing about your creative process about your books and guys if you haven't read anuja's books you have to start she's got an entire array of books to choose from And with that it's a wrap on this episode of Chasing Creativity. We were chatting with Anuja Chandramouli on writing, on dancing, on creativity and all that she does. Follow me on my social media handles at Kiran Mandral and subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. We are available on Spotify, Binge Pods, Apple Podcasts and all other major platforms. See you next week. Yeah.